Over the last year, I've written a number of what I call off-series short stories. These are short stories which they're not necessarily part of any other series that I'm writing, so they're not part of On the Subject of Trolls, for example. Over the last year, I've written four of these things. I think I published the first one almost exactly a year ago, and then I published the subsequent ones sort of every few months after that. And all of these stories have... They've had a sort of similar style to them, um, a style which is in many ways quite similar to On the Subject of Trolls, um, but it deviates from that a little bit. So all four of the stories, they're quite... Um, I mean, I think of them as being like fairy tales, but the problem with the word fairy tale... I mean, I think of them as being like traditional fairy tales, but the problem with the word fairy tale, when a lot of people hear the word fairy tale, they think of the sort of Disney-style fairy tale, which, you know, the Disney fairy tales at least all of them, were adapted from traditional fairy tales, but the, the tone of them and the style of them was changed quite a lot in doing that. Um, so that, you know, a Disney fairy tale isn't necessarily the same thing as a traditional fairy tale. I think of these off-series short stories as being like traditional fairy tales. Um, I suppose in a sense, I mean, they have been described as like parables. They are quite like that. The general style of them is very remote, in a sense. So in a lot of them, in fact I think, not in, not in all of them, but in a lot of them, um, the characters don't have names. Um, they are just referred to by who they are, so like the emperor or um, the minister or the emperor's other ministers or the first man, the second man, the third man. They are just referred to by these sort of titles, just by the, uh, a phrase or a, a name that describes their function within the story. Um, so they're quite remote in that sense. A lot of the details of the individual characters doesn't actually matter. So this is particularly true of the four that I've done in the last year. One of them was The Emperor's Pink Elephant. This was particularly true in that, and I'm going to go more into that story in a moment. But in that story, um, there is a series of characters, nine characters, who are just called the first man, the second man, the third man. And we know really nothing about these people. Um, we don't know what they look like, what they sound like. Um, we know only what we need to know about their opinions on things and their thoughts about the world. I think the most we ever learn about them in terms of their general presence is that the first man is described as being um, eloquent and rational and so on. So we only know a very small amount about their personality. For the most part, we don't know anything about them. And that's true of most of the characters in the story. They're just referred to as the minister or the emperor or the emperors on the ministers. And so on. So they all have this similar style. And that style, which is similar to the style that I've used for On the Subject of Trolls. On the Subject of Trolls, I mean, it is different because we do get to, to know a lot of the characters, particularly the trolls themselves. And we also get to know the narrator a lot in On the Subject of Trolls because he's very opinionated. Um, so it's, a, it's sort of a similar style. The most, I'm going on a tangent here, but the most similar story to this style from On the Subject of Trolls is Kill the Golden Goose, which also has this very remote style. But um, this style lends itself quite well, or it, um, a nice thing to do in this style is to give the stories what I call rhythm. Now, what do I mean when I say rhythm here? Um, because all, all these stories are written in prose, and normally the idea is that, well, the difference between prose and, say, poetry is that prose is just ordinary language with its ordinary structure. There's no particular metrical structure or rhythmic structure to it. It's just ordinary everyday language. And then poetry is language that has some sort of structure imposed onto it, often a metrical structure, where some li the lines will have um, a certain number of syllables or a certain number of words, perhaps, um, and the stress falls on certain syllables. Uh, that is one way of defining or describing the difference between prose and poetry. Of course, it's a lot of poetry that doesn't have metrical structure. But um, that's one way of thinking about the difference. Um, and uh, when I'm talking about rhythm in prose, which all of these um, off-series short stories are written in, and all of On the Subject of Trolls is written in, what do I mean? Uh, because I don't specifically necessarily mean that the writing has metrical structure, that it has a structure to the syllables and where the stress falls on them. Though I do, I do partly mean that. Um, 
So, in order to explain what I mean, I'm going to choose an example line from one of the stories, and that story is going to be uh, the Emperor's Pink Elephant, because there's one line in this story that really made me think about this a lot. This was something that I've been thinking about a lot as I was writing all four of these stories. Um, so the line from The Emperor's Pink Elephant that really makes me think about this is, it's fairly close to the beginning. Um, so the paragraph is, uh, and I'll, I'll read it in the voice I use for, uh, for reading these stories. Um, the Emperor's menagerie was bright and humid. It had tall walls and many glass domes. The fronds of the ferns and the cycads were a lush green, and the pools that sat and the streams that ran throughout the building were clear. Now, that last line is a great example of what I mean when I talk about rhythm in stories and what I, what I mean in this video. Um, so that particularly the, the end of the last sentence there, which is, and the pools that sat and the streams that ran throughout the building were clear. Now, that... Um, that clause, that, that um, part of the sentence, is almost in um, iambic septameter. So, and the pools that sat and the streams that, and the pools that sat and the streams that ran throughout the building were clear. Um, so, iambic septameter, similar to iambic pentameter, iambic septameter would be seven pairs of syllables with the stress falling on the second syllable each time. Um, when, obviously, pen, iambic pentameter is when it's five pairs of syllables. Um, that line is almost in iambic pen, uh, septameter. Um, and I say almost because it's like, and the pools that sat and the streams that ran. So that in some cases, the syllables double up and where there would normally be one syllable, you know, or two syllables in a pair, there's actually three because there's two on the first one. Um, so it's almost in iambic um, septameter, I'm forgetting. I'm forgetting which way around those words go now. Um, it's almost in that structure, um, but not quite. And even though, I mean, when you read this story, you just read it in your head. Obviously, when you're not having to pronounce the words, you don't necessarily hear that rhythmic structure very explicitly. But I think even when you read it, because the words force you to put the emphasis, or would force you to put the emphasis on certain syllables, even when you read it in your head, you can still sort of sense that rhythm to it. So even when you just read it, you can still get a sense that there's a kind of rhythm to it. And this is partly what I mean when I talk about rhythm in writing and how this is a, a thing that I was thinking about a lot when writing these stories. Um, because, I mean, in that case, that is a, a much more explicit kind of metrical rhythm in the same way that poetry sometimes has. Um, but that's not entirely what I mean about rhythm. That can provide a rhythm to it, right? With that sentence, as you're reading through it, because you can sense that rhythm to it, you can, it sort of, it gives the whole sentence and the whole paragraph a sense of rhythm, a sense of momentum. That's part of what I mean when I talk about rhythm in writing. Um, another aspect of it, so I, I think it's not just metrical structure that can give rhythm to a story. It's also things like, I, I think, alliteration and assonance and sort of half rhyme here and there, um, all of these kinds of things, essentially small moments of repetition, um, different kinds of repetition can help give a story rhythm. So actually the following paragraph is a good example of the other things which I sort of think of as providing rhythm to a story. So the paragraph after that is, but despite the grandeur of the architecture and greenery of the Emperor's Menagerie, most of the animals in it were rather unspectacular. There were lorikeets and parakeets, lemurs and macaques, pythons, puffins, porcupines and pangolins, chameleons, tortoises, sloths, a jaguar, a giraffe, and even a hippopotamus. But they all looked rather tired and grey. So that paragraph does something that I, I really liked doing in these stories, and also Kill the Golden Goose, where the, I kind of, that's where I kind of started doing this. Um, which is that it provides a list as a description, which sounds tremendously tedious. It's not. Um, but in, in this case, it's giving a list of the animals, which is a fairly obvious thing to do in this case. Later on, there's one where it gives um, a description of the various different things of what the, uh, the, uh, the elephant, which smells disgusting, what it smells of. So it's um, a nauseating stench of bitumen, vinegar, oyster sauce, burnt aubergine and piss. So again, I'd, I'd done a list there. But doing these lists um, sort of, imaginative lists is another way um, that I, I like to use to add 
um, rhythm into it. But that particular list, I think, shows um, the other things that I think contribute to the to rhythm in prose. Um, so it starts off, there are lorikeets and parakeets. Here we've got um, half rhyme. Obviously, lorikeets and parakeets end in the same five letters, um, and they're quite similar animals in uh, in real life. So there's a there's a symmetry to them, and I do have another video planned on um, symmetry in in storytelling, which is a related concept. I'm going on a tangent again. Um, but there's a, there's a symmetry between lorikeets and parakeets, um, but also half rhyme because they both end in keats. And then lemurs and macaques again a symmetry between the two um, uh, words because the types of animal are quite similar. And again we ha we now have this repeated. Um, structure. So something and something, comma, something and something. A repeated structure, one of which had half rhyme in it. Then there are four words, all of which begin with P. Pythons, puffins, porcupines, and pangolins. Alliteration, which I, again I think just provides a bit of rhythm to the sentence. Then we have, again, repeated structures. So we have chameleons, tortoises, and sloths, three nouns, three plural nouns, and then a jaguar, a giraffe, and a hippopotamus, three singular nouns. Um, so again, a repeated structure in the three nouns, in the first case plural and the first case singular, and of course using the magic number of three. So that whole sentence, even though it's just a list, there's a, there's a rhythm to it because there are these moments of structure and, and slight patterns to parts of it um, that I think give it rhythm. Now, this is something, adding rhythm to these stories is something I did a lot. I did it a lot through The Emperor's Pink Elephant, and I've done it through the other stories as well. And as I say, it relates closely to symmetry and storytelling, which is again kind of like about repeated patterns. But I suppose to conclude, that rhythm is something that I've put in all, to, all of these stories, and I, and I quite like it. Why do I think it's valuable? What's the point of, of putting it in stories? I think, and I think this, as I said at the beginning, um, you know, the, the tone of these stories, the style of these stories, I think lends, it very, lends itself very well to this sort of thing. Um, because this kind of, you know, adding pat slight patterns in places, adding slight symmetries, it can create this slightly more surreal um, sense to the stories, which is quite useful for these parable-like stories. But I think the reason why it's quite good to add rhythm into stories, particularly short stories, it's very difficult to do this for a novel, but particularly for short stories. The reason why I think rhythm is quite a valuable thing to have in the story is that it gives the story, firstly, it gives it a sense of momentum. Um, it gives it this, this sense that the story is going somewhere, that it's proceeding. Um, and secondly, I think it can be tremendously satisfying when you see these, when it has this kind of rhythm to it, when it has a kind of flow to it. It's it is, I think, one of the things that can make prose nice to read and just satisfying to read. This is actually something, to go on another tangent, this is actually something that I think is perhaps slightly underappreciated in um, certainly the online writing sphere. Um, I think the online writing sphere is much more geared towards compelling plots, which is fair enough, but I think it is geared more towards compelling plots rather than um, just pleasant, satisfying, um, enjoyable use of language and use of words. Um, I think there's almost an attitude of it doesn't really matter what words you use and what phrases you use and, and how satisfying just the words themselves are as long as the plot and the suspense and the mystery is satisfying. I generally think that both should be pretty good. You should, you know, a story, if indeed it is the sort of story that requires like mystery and suspense and so on. Yes, it's very good to have those things, very important to have those things, but it can also at the same time be written using language, which is just in itself satisfying. Because I think when a, if a sentence is written in, a, in an exquisite way, it is just satisfying to read the sentence. Um, if, if a sentence is particularly imaginative, it can just be satisfying to read the sentence. And similarly, I think when a story, particularly a short story, has some rhythm to it, this just makes it a more satisfying story, and particularly it can make the ending um, a more satisfying conclusion to reach. So that's what I mean when I talk about rhythm in writing. That's how I add rhythm into my own writing. That's why I think rhythm is important in writing.
Is this something that anyone else does? Am I the only person who does this? If you're also an author and this is something you like to do in your writing, um, let me know down in the comments below how you do it, um, because there may be other useful techniques uh, for how to do this. Um, the purpose of this channel is for me to go on about um, my own books this, and my own stories, the stuff that I write, as well as just writing in general, how I do it in general, thoughts in general about writing. Um, so if you're interested in that sort of stuff, there are other videos on here, go and have a look at those and consider subscribing as there will be more in future.